So hi everyone. So all of you who are new here, myself Dr. Simran Gaur. I'm a radiology resident and I'm an ECFMG certified physician. I cleared my USMD step one and step two. And I'm here to teach you the important concepts for NEET PG 2023 for the time being. And I've picked up very high yield topics that I would be subsequently taking in the coming lectures. So first of all, we'll begin uh, with this important topic. So beat INI, CT, beat NEET PG, this topic is really, very, very high yield. So first of all, we will be talking about the conditions that lead to dry tap on the bone marrow aspiration. Okay, so that means whenever you try to do a bone marrow aspiration, you don't get anything. You are not able to aspirate bone marrow. Okay, so what are the conditions that lead to dry tap on bone marrow aspiration? So number one condition, that is myelofibrosis. Okay, so myelofibrosis is number one. Number two is hairy cell leukemia. Number three is aplastic anemia. And number four is AMLM7, that is the acute megakerocytic leukemia. Okay. So, if I ask you one point regarding aplastic anemia, what is aplastic anemia, guys? Can anyone answer this question? What is aplastic anemia? Remember aplastic anemia when you talk about it. Remember, this is just like the, you imagine it like the uh, failure of the bone marrow, bone marrow failure. So, aplastic anemia is equivalent to bone marrow failure. Bone marrow failure. Okay. Now, what is the function of bone marrow? What is the function of bone marrow? In the bone marrow, there occurs hematopoiesis. In the bone marrow, there occurs hematopoiesis. And what is the meaning of hematopoiesis? Yes, guys, what is hematopoiesis? Anyone? Hematopoiesis. So, hematopoiesis means formation of blood cells the formation of blood cells that is hematopoiesis okay Mansi, you gave the correct answer now imagine if in aplastic anemia the bone marrow is failing right so what is the consequence so the answer here is easy okay just a second the answer here becomes very easy because if bone marrow fails obviously no hematopoiesis no hematopoiesis okay and if there is no hematopoiesis what will happen the blood cells are not being formed the so blood cells are not being formed all the cell lines will be reduced right that is pancytopenia that is pancytopenia all right pancytopenia means reduction in all the cell lines so pancytopenia will include anemia thrombocytopenia thrombocytopenia and the third one is leukopenia leukopenia so let us make it simple anemia is reduced rbc mass thrombocytopenia means reduced platelet count leukopenia means re reduced wbc's reduced wbc count okay so this is what happens in case of aplastic anemia and it has been asked in the previous years that what happens normally is when bone marrow fails when bone marrow fails yes i definitely i am uh, trying to take more classes i'm just trying to manage my routine with these uh, new classes that have been added so i'll try my best to do so Yes, so coming back, when bone marrow fails, usually what should happen? Like, obviously, body has to compensate. If bone marrow is not making the blood cells, where do you think the responsibility now goes? Anyone? Remember, if bone marrow fails, there occurs something known as extramedullary hematopoiesis extra medullary hematopoiesis so you might have come across this term several times extra medullary means outside the bone marrow okay hematopoiesis means formation of blood cells so if the blood cells are being formed 
apart from the bone marrow somewhere else okay that is extra medullary metaphoresis and liver and spleen they do the do this job liver and spleen okay that is why liver and spleen could be enlarged in size hepatomegaly splenomegaly so hepatosplenomegaly could occur but there's a very important point here that you have to keep in mind when you read robbins also they have clearly mentioned that no hepato splenomegaly seen in aplastic anemia okay so remember this important point okay although the bone marrow is failing here what happens is no hepatosplenomegaly seen in aplastic anemia this is an important point because this is a, a kind of deviation from what is taking place normally all right okay so these are the conditions that yield the dry tap on the bone marrow aspiration now moving on to the next high yield topic so these are the deformities so you could get a picture in the exam and they could ask you okay what is this deformity and in which condition you see that this okay so before coming on to the deformity seen in the rheumatoid arthritis i would like to talk more about rheumatoid arthritis at least the main important high yield points yes now you tell me guys uh, when you talk about rheumatoid arthritis what type of uh, presentation are you expecting in a patient what type of presentation are you expecting in a patient who is having rheumatoid arthritis yes a patient comes to you a patient comes to you the patient most likely would be a young or a middle aged female middle aged female she will come to your office and she will say doctor i have pain in my hands and feet pain in hands and feet and apart from pain there will be swelling also so most most commonly they have swelling in the hands okay in the fingers and along with that they will complain of morning stiffness morning stif stiffness and theoretically when you talk about it the morning stiffness reported by a patient of rheumatoid arthritis it, it is at least 1 hour at least 1 hour okay then an, another important hint in case of the patient complaining of uh, patient coming to you with rheumatoid arthritis is reduced hand grip reduced hand grip so how they could write this in the history they could write that the patient is having problem in holding objects for example she tries to have a tea cup of tea but when she tries to hold the cup okay it falls down because she is not able to maintain that hand grip so reduced hand grip and along with that these patients who have rheumatoid arthritis guys they have pain okay apart from the pain in the small joints that is the hand and feet they also have pain in the spine but if they ask you which part of the spine is commonly involved in case of rheumatoid arthritis which one would you answer which part of spine is commonly involved in the rheumatoid arthritis patient anyone which part of spine is involved in rheumatoid arthritis is it cervical spine is it dorsal spine or lumbar spine your answer is going to be cervical spine cervical spine okay this is an important point that supposing someone needs intubation and the patient is having patient is having rheumatoid arthritis okay but before doing uh, intubation you should be careful about one thing because intubation in a patient who is having rheumatoid arthritis could be dangerous what is the reason what is the reason so this is important clinically correlating point the problem here is that the patients who have rheumatoid arthritis cervical spine could be involved and there could be atlantoaxial instability so remember this atlantoaxial atlantoaxial instability okay so if you try to intubate the patient there could be dislocation okay exactly so there could be subluxation of the atlantoaxial joint so this is the problem that occurs in the patients who have rheumatoid arthritis and the cervical spine is involved okay another question regarding rheumatoid arthritis uh, what is the most uh, specific antibody so you you know that uh, rheumatoid arthritis just a second you know that rheumatoid arthritis is an autoimmune condition autoimmune condition right what is the most specific antibody implicated in rheumatoid arthritis which is the most most specific antibody implicated in rheumatoid arthritis 
Yes. Anyone? Your answer is anti-CCP. Anti-CCP. So, anti-CCP, remember this is the specific test for rheumatoid arthritis. So, what you have to do is, RA factor is also being done. So, you go for the RA factor testing, but this is not specific. Okay, although the sensitivity is high, but RA factor is not specific for rheumatoid arthritis. It could be increased in other conditions also. So, you have to rely on anti-CCP. If anti-CCP is positive, that means you are talking about rheumatoid arthritis. Okay. Now, next, what is the drug of choice for rheumatoid arthritis? What is the drug of choice for rheumatoid arthritis? Anyone? That drug starts with M. That drug starts with M. Exactly. Okay. So your answer here is methotrexate. Methotrexate. Yes, I you also give the right answer. That is DMAD, disease modifying anti rheumatoid drugs. But if you talk about the drug of choice or DMAD of choice for rheumatoid arthritis, your answer is going to be methotrexate. Okay. Now, next question regarding the rheumatoid arthritis. What is the mechanism of action of methotrexate? So this we have discussed in the previous lectures also. What is the mechanism of action of methotrexate? Can anyone tell me? Your answer is going to be it is dihydrofolate reductase inhibitor. Okay, so methotrexate is dihydrofolate reductase inhibitor. Next, so if you plan to start methotrexate in a patient who is uh, having rheumatoid arthritis, would you like to do something before prescribing methotrexate? Would you like to do something before prescribing methotrexate? Anyone? So the answer to this question is that yes, you are going to take the baseline LFTs. You are going to take the baseline LFTs. Okay, baseline LFT means this is the liver function test. So before starting the treatment, you have the report of liver function test. Okay, what is the problem here? Why do you want to take the baseline LFT? What is the reason? What is the reason? Why do you want to take the baseline LFT levels here? The answer is methotrexate is a hepatotoxic drug. Okay, methotrexate is a hepatotoxic drug. So obviously, when you start methotrexate treatment, and ultimately you will follow up by doing LFTs. And if the levels of SGOT or SGPT are more, uh, more than two to three times the normal, then you will be worried about the hepatotoxicity being caused by methotrexate. Okay, another point here. What problem can methotrexate cause in the lungs? What problem can methotrexate cause in the lungs? Anyone? What is the problem that could be caused by methotrexate in the lungs? The answer to this question is yes, Dark Knight, Gurjeet, you gave the right answer. The answer is pulmonary fibrosis. The answer is pulmonary fibrosis. Okay, so methotrexate could induce pulmonary fibrosis in a patient. And then another side effect of methotrexate is hair loss, alopecia. Okay, and then a very important side effect. It suppresses the bone marrow. That is myelosuppression. Myelosuppression. All right. And it is antifolate. So you give the leucovorin rescue therapy along with it. So remember these points regarding rheumatoid arthritis. Now coming on to more points. So now we're going to talk about the deformities that you see in the patients of rheumatoid arthritis. Number one is ulnar deviation of the fingers. The fingers would be deviated towards the medial side. Okay, ulnar deviation. Then talking about the second deformity that we have is swan neck. So if you can see this picture, what you can appreciate is that the DIP is there in flexion and PIPs are in hyperextension. Okay. So you can just try to make that uh, visual memory of this van neck deformity. And if you know what happens in van neck, you will be able to easily answer what happens in the next deformity. Okay. So this is botanist deformity. What happens here is 
that DIP is in hyperextension and PIP is in deflection. So that is just the opposite of Van Eyck deformity. Know this point? And then we have Z line deformity. So if you can see this picture, this Z line deformity in which there is hyperextension of the interphalangeal joint with the fixed flexion of the metacarpophalangeal joint. Okay. So know this. These are the three deformities along with the annular deviation of the fingers that you appreciate in the patient who is having rheumatoid arthritis. Moving on to one more question here. Yes, what type of arthritis is rheumatoid arthritis? Like is it a degenerative arthritis or is it inflammatory arthritis? What do you think so? What do you think about it? Anyone? What type of arthritis is rheumatoid arthritis? Yes, it is erosive arthritis. Okay, it is inflammatory arthritis. Remember inflammatory, destructive or erosive arthritis. Okay. But if I ask you a question here, what is the degenerative arthritis that is associated with old age? Degenerative arthritis, non-destructive, your answer is going to be osteoarthritis. Your answer is going to be osteoarthritis. Okay, osteoarthritis you usually see in the patients who are elderly. With increasing age, there is wear and tear and ultimately the articular cartilage gets damaged. Okay. So what are the findings of osteoarthritis on an x-ray? Anyone? Supposing someone is having osteoarthritis of the knee. So what are the findings of osteoarthritis on an x-ray? So what kind of picture you could be given? So there could be joint space reduction. The joint space would be reduced, joint space reduced. Okay, then you could be able to appreciate multiple osteophytes. Okay, so osteophytes could be seen. And then tibial spiking, tibial spiking. Then we have a whitish line here. Okay, so on x-ray you will see the kind of uh, radiopacity here that is subchondral sclerosis. Subchondral sclerosis. Okay, subchondral. So chondral is related to the cartilage. Sub means below. So below the articular cartilage there will be sclerosis that is the hardening or thickening. Okay, so these are few of the features that you see in case of osteoarthritis knee. Okay, on x-ray. Now, coming back, we would be moving on to the next topic here. So, in the exam, we might have seen that uh, they ask about splints. Okay, so there are different splints and these are the most important of them. So, number one, when we talk about the orthopedic splint, that is Thomas knee splint. This is for knee immobilization. Okay, this is for the knee immobil immobilization. Then we have Boller Brown splint, that is for the femoral fracture. Then we have Dennis Brown, that is for the CTV. Dennis Brown splint is for the CTV. Then we have Aeroplane splint, that is for the brachial plexus injury. Then the knuckle bender for the ulnar nerve and cock up splint for the radial nerve palsy. And then we have Milwaukee or the Boston brace, that is for the scoliosis. Okay, now. When uh, someone is asking, is it important for US only? The splints are not important for US only. This is just for knee PG and INICP. Okay. We need not know this for US only. When you talk about the scoliosis, how would you like to describe scoliosis? Anyone? How would you like to describe scoliosis? Scoliosis is S shaped spine. Okay. Easiest way to remember scoliosis is S shaped spine. Okay, if I ask you this question, supposing this is the 80 year old female, 80 year old female coming to you with this type of posture. Okay, what are we talking about here? This is kyphosis. This is kyphosis. Okay, 
So scoliosis is like S shaped spine. Kyphosis, if you can appreciate here. Okay. So why do why why I've written here 80 year old female? See what happens is with increasing age, the chances of osteoporosis in females it is increased. So 80 year old female most likely could be having osteoporosis. And if osteoporosis is severe enough, there could be vertebral compression fractures that leads to reduced vertebral height and ultimately there could be deformity of the spine that is kyphosis. All right. Moving on to the next topic. So what you have to do is you have to pick up the keywords from every question. So supposing the question mentions quadman triangle or sunray appearance. So although this is not that specific, but still for exam point of view, you will choose osteosarcoma osteosarcoma okay then onion peel appearance ewing sarcoma ewing sarcoma then soap bubble appearance that is the osteoclastoma these three things regarding bone tumor very high yield points okay i will add a few points more about the bone tumors here so one by one we would be discussing this in the form of questions okay so when you talk about the Paget's disease of the bone. Paget's disease of the bone. If someone is having Paget's disease of the bone, which type of uh, cancer of the bone risk is increased? Which type of uh, bone cancer risk is increased in case of Paget's disease of the bone? Your answer is going to be? Yes. Quickly answer this one. Mansi, what type of cancer risk is increased in patients of Paget disease of bone? Cancer risk. Your answer here is going to be osteosarcoma. Osteosarcoma. Okay. Second question. What are the associations of osteosarcoma? What are the common associations of osteosarcoma? What are the common associations of osteosarcoma? So your answer is three main the three main associations. Number one, Paget's disease of the bone. Paget's disease of the bone. Then number two, Lee Fremoni syndrome. Lee Fremoni syndrome. And third is retinoblastoma. Third is retinoblastoma. Okay, so these are very common in the uh, Sorry, these are very common associations seen in case of osteosarcoma. So when you talk about the pager disease, so one one word here regarding every condition, pager disease of the bone, what happens is the bones become very weak because there is defect. Okay, there, there occurs three stages in the pager disease of the bone. So uh, first is the osteoclastic, then osteoblastic and the mixed phase. Okay, and ultimately, if you do testing, if you do diagnostic testing in case of pager disease of the bone, which marker would be elevated in pager disease of the bone? So what type of point they could add in the question regarding pagets? Your answer is increase in the ALP. Everything is normal except ALP. So ALP levels are high in case of pager disease of the bone. Okay. Another hint regarding pager disease of the bone is increase in the heart size. So the patient will complain that the helmet is no longer fitting okay this kind of complaint also be could be given in the question or their hat is now tight okay they are not able to wear the old hat that they used to and then these patients have hearing loss also hearing loss because the because the yes what is the reason for hearing loss in pager disease of the bone anyone what is the cause of hearing loss in a patient of pager disease of the bone? The ear ossicles, okay? If the ear ossicles are involved, the patient could, have be, could be having the hearing loss, all right? Then talking about the Lefromoni syndrome, in Lefromoni syndrome, there occurs P53 mutations. P53 is a tumor suppressor gene. So if mutations occur in P53, the patient could be having multiple cancers at a young age. Multiple cancers at a young age. And the last one, the very important thing regarding retinoblastoma. Retinoblastoma, you could be given history of a child having a mass in the eye. Mass in the eyeball. Okay, there could be protruding mass. And very important point regarding retinoblastoma is the two-hit hypothesis theory. Two-hit hypothesis theory. 
and then the last point regarding retinoblastoma that we're gonna add here yes so normally when you put light in the eye there occurs red reflex in the patients who have retinoblastoma you will see a white reflex that is known as leukocoria okay so this is very important leukocoria so what you can do is after this lecture you can look at the picture where they have uh, you can just google it so you see the white reflex that is leukocoria these are the important hints for retinoblastoma all right now moving on to another high yield topic so that is pill induced esophagitis okay so before discussing about the drugs that could lead to the esophagitis we should be well versed to what is esophagitis so what do you understand by esophagitis anyone what is esophagitis what do you understand by esophagitis so guys whenever itis is there at the end that it means inflammation so they are talking about esophageal inflammation right so how would you define esophagitis the inflammation of the esophageal mucosa okay inflammation of the esophageal mucosa so obviously the drugs they are irritating the esophageal mucosa and ultimately leading to the inflammation the inflammation of the esophageal mucosa is esophagitis now let us talk about the drugs that could lead to esophagitis okay so number one is bisphosphonates bisphosphonates now you already know guys uh, if you have attended the first lecture here on youtube i had talked about bisphosphonates so bisphosphonates are the drug of choice for what condition anyone so bisphosphonates are drug of choice for which condition Yes, bisphosphonates are the drug of choice for osteoporosis. Exactly. So whenever you talk about bisphosphonates, think about few points. Okay, I am going to write the keywords here. Bisphosphonates. Number one, they are the drug of choice for osteoporosis. Osteoporosis. Second, they could be also used in the pager disease of the bone. Pager disease of the bone. Third, the names of the bisphosphonates you should be well versed with: alendronate. Just the examples: alendronate, then risedronate, risedronate, and zoledronic acid. These are the common bisphosphonates: zoledronic acid. Okay. Next point regarding bisphosphonates: How do they work? They inhibit the osteoclastic activity. How by inducing the apoptosis of osteoclast? Okay, so they induce the apoptosis of osteoclast. So by inducing the apoptosis of osteoclast, guys, what is happening? So if the osteoclast are dying, there won't be any bone resorption. If no bone resorption, obviously you are preventing the bone weakness, right? So osteoclast were resorbing the bone; they were eating away the bone. And now that is being inhibited by the bisphosphonate, so that is how it is helping in the osteoporosis. All right. Then the side effect that is osteonecrosis of the jaw or atypical uh, femoral fractures and other side effect is pill induced esophagitis. Okay, this is what we were talking about. So guys, when someone is having pill induced esophagitis, what could be the presentation of a patient? How do you think the patient could come to you? Yes. So let us make a case here. Okay. So the patient who was diagnosed with osteoporosis, the patient who was diagnosed with osteoporosis was prescribed alendronate, alendronate, and after. few days the patient comes to the office patient comes to the hospital with dysphagia and odynophagia and odynophagia so what is odynophagia what do you understand by odynophagia and what do you understand by dysphagia so dysphagia means difficulty in swallowing okay dysphagia means difficulty in 
swallowing and odynophagia means painful swallowing okay odynophagia means painful swallowing so while the patient tries to eat something the patient would be having pain while swallowing okay that is odynophagia okay so if someone is having esophagitis this these could be the common presentations of a patient okay now what do you think what has led to this condition the answer is simple here they have written alendronate okay and alendronate is an example of a bisphosphonate so remember this point so what could have been done in order to prevent the pill and use esophagitis caused by bisphosphonates so we as physicians should also provide the solutions for the problems right so if you already know that there is some risk of pill induced esophagitis with bisphosphonate so how would you like to avoid this how to prevent pill induced esophagitis yes so mcq wala and mansi you gave the right answer so how to prevent the pill induced esophagitis your answer is ki while you are prescribing the medication to the patient you will always advise the patient to stay upright stay upright for at least 30 minutes okay so supposing someone has consumed the pill okay for the next 30 minutes the patient should not lie down so you tell the patient ki do not lie down immediately after taking the medication stay upright go for a walk okay but do not lie down why why do you say so why do you say so the reason is simple so if the patient is lying down immediately after taking the pill okay what would happen so supposing pill is there okay there is a risk of reflux there is a risk of reflux so along with the gastric contents the pill is also going to come up into the esophagus and it is going to erode the esophageal mucosa and ultimately leading to esophagitis okay and along with that you will also tell the patient to take it with plenty of water so two things you have to keep in mind take it with plenty of water and stay upright for at least 30 minutes okay now in the next question arises if someone already has got this esophagitis okay so what would you do so first step should be to stop the drug stop the drug that has caused it okay so you should know the drugs that lead to pill induced esophagitis so one of that was bisphosphonates moving on to the second drug moving on to the second drug that leads to the pill induced esophagitis that is tetracyclines okay so supposing i give you a history here a patient having lyme's disease was prescribed drug x now presenting to the hospital to your clinic having odynophagia and dysphagia okay similarly we can make another history that could be given to you a patient having acne was prescribed the oral antibiotic and after taking that antibiotic the patient developed photosensitivity as well as the patient developed esophagitis yes so these two kind of histories you would only be able to crack this if you know the concept here okay lyme disease first of all let's do the micro integration here what is responsible for causing lyme disease which organism is uh, implicated in uh, causing lyme disease sai the answer is not clindamycin here okay which uh, which organism leads to lyme disease your answer is borrelia burgdorferi borrelia burgdorferi 
okay second question what is the vector for the organism that leads to lime disease what is that your answer is exodistic third question what is the drug of choice for lime disease what is the drug of choice for lime disease your answer is doxycycline the drug of choice for lime disease is doxycycline another question doxycycline belongs to which class of antibiotics your answer is tetracycline okay so doxycycline belongs to tetracycline group of antibiotics another question give me example of other type of tetracycline antibiotic any other tetracycline antibiotic your answer is minocycline minocycline okay so similarly here patient is having acne so in acne a oral antibiotic is being prescribed oral antibiotic we are talking about not the topical okay so it could be minocycline or it could be doxycycline okay now when you talk about doxycycline doxycycline is having a lot of side effects for example photosensitivity and along with that doxycycline or tetracyclines they are also implicated in causing esophagitis so you should also know okay where this could fit in you should also make history in your mind okay where they could give you the points regarding doxycycline all right then iron tablets if you are prescribing iron tablets there is a possibility that they could be pill induced esophagitis one point here iron tablets uh, they are being prescribed along with one more supplementation what is that if you give iron supplementation that is ferrous sulfate along with that you also give one more kind of supplementation that is your answer here is vitamin c vitamin c supplementation it's not folic acid uh, like you are thinking in a different way i was about to ask you okay, iron is being prescribed with vitamin c supplementation what is the reason okay the reason here is that vitamin c increases the absorption of vitamin c increases the absorption of iron that is why vitamin c supplementation is given along with the iron supplementation okay then potassium chloride this could also lead to pill induced esophagitis then non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs okay at least you should know the names of the non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs so what are the names of nsaids what are the names of nsaids number 1 yes diclofenac these are the common names diclofenac then then we have naproxen naproxen then we have ketorolac ketorolac then we have ibuprofen ibuprofen then we have indomethacin indomethacin etc okay what is the mechanism of action of nsaids they inhibit the cox enzyme cox is cyclooxygenase by inhibiting the cyclooxygenase whose production is inhibited your answer is prostaglandin so prostaglandin synthesis is inhibited if you give nsaids all right another question this is important point you tell me the name of selective cox2 inhibitor selective cox2 inhibitor selective cox2 inhibitor means a drug that selectively inhibits cox2 only not cox1 so there are two cox that is the Uh, cyclooxygenase enzyme number one and two. Okay, so the selective cyclooxygenase two inhibitor is selicoxib. Selicoxib. Okay, remember this point. And selicoxib is one of the sulfa drug also. Sulfa drug. So you should avoid this selicoxib in a patient who is sulfa drug allergic. Okay. So this was important point. Now, if you can see this picture. if you can see this picture this is the endoscopic picture okay what they have shown here is punched out ulcers and erythematous mucosa okay 
So if you are given endoscopic picture and then they are telling you could, uh, this uh, patient is having a dinophagia, dysphagia after taking some pill. Okay. So you would think about these main drugs and ultimately you will try to fit in with the history. All right. Moving on to the next point here. Yes. So this is the history. A patient of AIDS comes to the clinic with the dysphagia and odinophagia. Okay. A patient having AIDS. So number one. What is AIDS? Can anyone tell me what is AIDS? Is AIDS and HIV same? Is AIDS and HIV same? Yes, guys. What do you think? Is there any difference between AIDS and HIV infection? If you say no, then you have to answer okay, why. What is the difference between AIDS and HIV? See. There is a difference between AIDS and HIV. If the patient gets infected with human immunodeficiency virus, if there is infection with HIV, you will call the patient to be HIV positive patient. Okay. But when you talk about AIDS, that is acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. Acquired immunodeficiency syndrome means that HIV patient could have AIDS if the CD4 count is less than, if the CD4 count is less than what? Your answer is 200. Okay. If the CD4 count is less than 200 or the patient has AIDS defining conditions, AIDS defining illnesses, Okay, so you should read about AIDS defining illnesses. The example is a Kaposi sarcoma. Okay, then basilary angiomatosis. Then uh, we have a CMV esophagitis, candida esophagitis, oral thrush, oral leukoplakia, hairy leukoplakia. So there are different kinds of uh, AIDS defining illnesses. You should know about them. Okay. So, if you talk about HIV, HIV positive individual means a patient who is getting infected with HIV virus, right? But AIDS means that the HIV positive individual, if in that patient the CD4 count is either less than 200 or the patient is now developing AIDS defining illnesses, then you call the patient to have AIDS, okay? Second question here. Now, the patient of AIDS comes to the clinic with dysphagia and odinophagia. What is the differential diagnosis, okay? So dysphagia and odinophagia, that means the patient is having problem in swallowing. Number one, difficulty in swallowing and secondly, painful swallowing. Okay. And already the patient is having AIDS. So you should think here about infective esophagitis. You should think. So someone gave the answer of pneumocystis gyrobagai. Yes, that is the kind of opportunistic infection or AIDS depending condition. Okay. Here in this scenario, you will think about infective esophagitis. Infective esophagitis. That means the esophageal mucosal inflammation that occurs is secondary to the infection. Okay. So what are the three infections that could lead to esophagitis in a patient who is having AIDS? Can anyone tell me the name of three infections? Yes. Number one is candidiasis. Number two. What comes on number two? Yes, number two is CMV. And number three is herpetic. Okay, herpetic esophagitis. So guys, this is very, very important table. Know this one. Okay, so there are three differential diagnoses of infective esophagitis in a patient who is having AIDS. Number one is candidal esophagitis. So obviously that is caused by candida albicans. Then we have herpetic esophagitis that is caused by herpes simplex virus. Then we have CMV esophagitis that is caused by the cytomegalovirus. All right. So how would you try to differentiate between these three infective types of esophagitis? Esophagitis. Okay. So this is the important point. So number one, when you talk about the candidal esophagitis, 
and when you do endoscopy in such a case if it is candida esophagitis you will appreciate white plaques okay so on endoscopy you would be appreciating the white plaques in case of candida esophagitis in case of herpetic esophagitis you would be appreciating punched out ulcers and what is the most common location of herpetic esophagitis your answer is distal esophagus okay distal esophagus having punched out ulcers remember this then talking about the cmv esophagitis very very high yield point here very high yield point here linear ulcers linear ulcers okay so if the question mentions dysphagia or dinophagia patient has engaged and ultimately on endoscopy it was being found linear ulcers your answer is going to be that the esophagitis is due to cytomegalovirus all right another end that could be given to you in the question so that is regarding the candidal esophagitis so histopathological finding would show you pseudo hyphae so if you see pseudo hyphae they are pointing towards the candidal esophagitis in case of herpetic esophagitis you would be seeing multi nucleated giant cells and intranuclear cowdery a inclusion bodies okay so this is important hint in case of herpetic esophagitis okay so for candida you can prefer the fluconazole okay for herpetic esophagitis you can prefer acyclovir and for cmv you can prefer gencyclovir or valgencyclovir so that was about the infective esophagitis and we have also covered the esophagitis that was caused by the medications okay so let us move on to the next high yield topic now so look at the history here and try to answer this question okay a patient presenting to you uh, patient presenting to the emergency with sudden onset severe epigastric pain patient presenting to the emergency with sudden onset severe epigastric pain radiating to the back radiating to the back okay further investigations were being done and it was being found that serum lipase levels they were more than yes how much two or three what should be answer here more than or equal to three times the normal more than or equal to three times the normal so serum lipase if it is more than or equal to three times the normal range or the normal limit okay this makes the diagnosis provisional diagnosis of acute pancreatitis okay this makes the provisional diagnosis of acute pancreatitis remember this so that means serum lipase level should be at least more than or equal to 3 times the normal all right and the patient should be having the sudden onset of severe epigastric pain that goes to the back also that is radiating to the back right now let us move on to the next question okay okay so supposing you have come at a provisional diagnosis of acute pancreatitis what could be the causes of acute pancreatitis so this is also very very important point so what do you think what are the causes of pancreatitis anyone what are the different causes of pancreatitis so if i ask you two most common causes of pancreatitis which one will you answer so write down here two most common and mark two arrows number one is alcohol so supposing someone is a uh, chronic alcoholic okay since many years he has been consuming alcohol every day so that is alcoholism is a very important cause of pancreatitis second is gallstones exactly i can't show you give the right answer mcq also give the right answer so alcohol and gallstones they are the most common causes of pancreatitis acute pancreatitis okay now let us talk about the other causes also so these are the causes of acute pancreatitis number 1 idiopathic idiopathic means in a few cases the cause is not known cause is not known then you talk about the gall stones if there are stones in the gall bladder okay then it could lead to pancreatitis 
then ethanol ethanol okay that is alcohol then trauma if there is trauma after the trauma there could be a risk of acute pancreatitis then steroids that is the corticosteroids they could lead to pancreatitis then mumps 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 infection is prone to cause acute pancreatitis then we have so very important uh, point regarding mumps yes when you talk about mumps very important point is that it could lead to arthritis and ultimately the patients they could become sterile in the post pubertal age group post pubertal age group okay so remember this post pubertal age group not before puberty but post pubertal then talking about the autoimmune diseases the different autoimmune conditions also could lead to pancreatitis then scorpion sting this could also lead to pancreatitis then hypercalcemia and hypertriglyceridemia so this is a very important point if someone is having triglyceride levels more than 1000 mg per deciliter this is very important risk factor for acute pancreatitis then ERCP that is endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography okay so this is therapeutic also and a diagnostic procedure okay in which the endoscope is being inserted from via the duodenum ultimately into the bile duct okay so you can visualize the bile ducts and you could do the procedures also supposing you can remove the stone also via ERCP so that is why they say ERCP is both diagnostic as well as therapeutic but when someone is doing ERCP there is a risk of acute pancreatitis in some patients then drugs what are the drugs that that could lead to pancreatitis so drug induced pancreatitis so someone is asking how long is the lecture lecture is going to end in another 5 uh, 7 minutes okay so that is one hour lecture so the drugs that lead to pancreatitis number one sulfonamides or the sulfa drugs sulfa drugs so in the previous lectures here okay i had made a list of sulfa drugs why that is important because if the question mentions the patient is allergic to sulfa drugs you should avoid these drugs all right So the names of the sulfa drugs are sulfa methoxazole. Again, I'll repeat few of them: sulfa methoxazole, then sulfa diazine, sulfa diazine. Then third is sulfonylureas, sulfonylureas. Then we have salicoxib. Then we have dapsin. Then we have furosemide. then we have hydrochlorothiazide hydrochlorothiazide then we have estazolamide estazolamide then we also have probenecid probenecid okay all of these are the examples of sulfa drugs that means they have sulfonamide group in their structure okay sulfonamide group another drug that could lead to pancreatitis that is didanosin where is didanosin given <clears throat> can anyone tell me in which condition is didanosin given your answer to this question is where is didanosin given yes that is a part of antiretroviral therapy yes so highly active antiretroviral therapy with this is what you are talking about heart therapy right so to hiv positive patients you give antiretroviral therapy and didanosin is one of the drug that belongs to nrt as nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor and it is implicated in causing acute pancreatitis okay then azathioprine azathioprine is a pro drug to 6 mercaptopurin and this is one of the immunosuppressive agent okay so this is also implicated in causing the pancreatitis then loop diuretics and the thiazide diuretics for example furosemide which is a loop diuretic and thiazide diuretic is hydrochlorothiazide okay so these could also lead to pancreatitis and ultimately valproate valproate is the anti epileptic drug but this is also used as a mood stabilizer for the patients who have bipolar disorder okay so know these points regarding the drugs that could lead to pancreatitis okay
the last table for today which is very very high yield so if you look at the previous year questions time and again they have tested on this concept of side effects of chemo drugs okay so supposing someone is having a cancer and the patient is put on the chemotherapy okay these drugs they are associated with these known side effects okay so the most common side effect should be on your tips so chemo side effects they are very very important so supposing someone is given cisplatin or carboplatin okay if someone has been given cisplatin or carboplatin what are the side effects most common side effects that could be appreciated if you give these drugs so number 1 is a caustic nerve damage number 2 is that these drugs are nephrotoxic okay so cisplatin and carboplatin they are nephrotoxic drugs and they lead to a caustic nerve damage then we have bleomycin and buselfan both of these drugs they lead to pulmonary fibrosis along with that methotrexate also could lead to pulmonary fibrosis but bleomycin buselfan pulmonary fibrosis all right then we have doxorubicin so this has been tested several times doxorubicin or donorubicin okay they lead to what type of cardiotoxicity your answer is dilated cardiomyopathy okay they lead to dilated cardiomyopathy the next question is how you can prevent the dilated cardiotoxicity dilated cardiomyopathy caused by the doxorubicin your answer is give dextrovaxin okay so remember this doxorubicin leads to the dilated cardiomyopathy dextrovaxin should be given if you want to prevent the cardiotoxicity caused by the doxorubicin or donorubicin then moving on to the vincristin vincristin that is causing the peripheral neuropathy okay so vincristin is causing the peripheral neuropathy and cyclophosphamide very commonly asked hemorrhagic cystitis and bladder carcinoma hemorrhagic cystitis and bladder carcinoma how you can prevent the hemorrhagic cystitis caused by the cyclophosphamide the answer to this question is give mesna this could be prevented by mesna all right one question here which parasite is associated in causing bladder carcinoma which parasite could lead to bladder carcinoma which parasitic infection could lead to bladder carcinoma your answer is yes yes the answer is kistosoma hematobium kistosoma hematobium hematobium all right then methotrexate five fluorouracil six mercaptopurin okay they have a common side effect of bone marrow suppression so what they could lead to pancytopenia so you could see pancytopenia in such patients that is anemia thrombocytopenia and leukopenia okay so these are the most common side effects that should be on your tips regarding the chemotherapeutic drugs okay so that ends the high yield topic for today i'll continue them with you tomorrow also okay so at the same time 8 pm please do tune in and watch the lecture and uh, an academy has come up with the offer so i'll show you that visual so they have reduced the prices so if you want to go ahead with the iconic subscription you can uh, do that because the sale is going to end tomorrow All right, and the new batch is starting on February 10, having duration of five months. So they have all the top class teachers. So you can just join in. They have very good offers going on. All right. All right, guys. Bye bye. Definitely, I'll take more classes, and uh, I'm so grateful that you attended this session. Bye bye. I'll see you guys tomorrow at 8 p.m. IST. Bye.